Stick with me, because we're going to learn all about butterflies and butterfly farming. Okay, I admit it. I love butterflies and I love plants. I understand that I have the same interest as an old lady or a 12 year old girl, but I don't really care because I really like butterflies. I'm not afraid to admit it. Did you know you can actually earn a profit by selling butterflies? There's actually butterfly farmers. Yeah, who knew? I decided to find out all about how this works and I went over to Magic Wings in Massachusetts. This place was unbelievable. It was a bunch of different greenhouses all tied together that you walk through and tour through. Now you gotta remember, it's up in New England, right next to New Hampshire. So it's cold a lot of years around here. It's, it's pretty darn cold. And I wonder why on earth would you set up a butterfly farm this far north? But I think it works to their advantage because there's really not many other places like it up north. So it becomes a big tourist attraction. A couple ways people make money off butterflies is, of course, being a tourist attraction where people walk around and enjoy the experience. But you can also raise butterflies to sell to other butterfly companies or people that are trying to start businesses or people that just want them for their garden. One of the things I didn't even know about is people buy them for their weddings and release butterflies for their wedding. I thought, um, I had no idea there's so many ways to sell butterflies and use them. I wanted to go through Magic Wings and I'm going to show you an interview that I got explaining a little more about how that works to be one of the big boys. And then after that, I'm actually going to take you through Magic Wings and show you a little, little bit more what they offer and how they expanded out to make money. Now that'll be really interesting if you're interested in setting up something similar. But most likely, if you're going to start with butterfly farming, you're going to start really small scale. I remember the first time I ever ran into something like this was I was still selling my books via festivals. When I first wrote Pirates of Savannah, I was out pushing these books at festivals. And I ran into a booth at a South Carolina festival that was just like a 10 by 20 tent that they had closed off and they would put like a little fan in there or air conditioner or something to keep keep the climate moderate and you would go in this tent and they had a bunch of plants out and they would release all these butterflies in this tent so it was a real neat experience just at a local fair and people first started that small scale after you get big enough and learn how it works you move into much larger productions and that's what magic wings is all about they're huge one of the more interesting things i found out when i studied butterfly farming was basically you first have to be a heck of a botanist. You've got to be able to grow plants, know plants, how they work together, and especially tropical plants and getting them all working together. I didn't know that, but that makes a lot of sense. When you walk into these places, it feels like you're in a jungle. It's hot in there and humid, and it feels like you stepped into the tropics. It's really surreal. I have to say, going into the Butterfly Conservatory was one of the coolest experiences I've ever had in my life. It's, I can't even explain it. You just have to experience it for yourself. It was so cool. For some reason, you're not allowed to bring in tripods or monopods to the conservatory, so sorry if this next part is a little shaky. They have the conservatory separated from the rest of the place, with a little safe room here so no butterflies get out. Welcome to the garden. Hi. How are you? Great. Wow. Good luck getting one to land. Wow, they're busy. They're everywhere. Wow. There is something we said for rainforest. Wow. <laughs> that thing grazed my nose. That's awesome. I finally caught up to a professional to have my butterfly questions answered. It's fertilizer. How do you get them to keep blooming to feed the butterflies, the plants? Oh, well, we go through a series of um, trimming. So we deadhead the flowers. 
And then, I don't know if you, let me show you the plants over here. Dire Straits, do you see how much we've chopped them back? We do a very deep pruning. And so, and so the deep pruning puts all the energy back into the roots to new growth and then to more flowers. So you can get them to grow flowers multiple times a year yes. instead of just once? Yep. Some of them all only do it a couple times a year. Some of them do it more frequently. But may, remember, most of these are tropical plants. They're used to constantly blooming. So it's never winter in our museum. We have to keep it at a tropical climate. So we never let it get below 68 at night and all through the winter. And we use a double wood-fired furnace. So we have two giant furnaces using recycled wood chips. And they recycle hot water around the edges of the museum. So this goes all winter long? All winter. It's never winter in here. Well, I was noticing if you look at the ceiling, it's just a single layer. How on earth do you keep that warm during the winter? The sun. I mean, yeah, the, the, it is a greenhouse, but I'm saying right. these are pretty hard winters up here. Yes, you, they you are. You have to burn yes, a lot of are. fuel to keep this. We do. Out. Yep. And we've got gas backup, and then we have oil backup for if we lose power. So we're good to go for a thousand gallons of oil. Probably about we can go about 72 hours if we lose power. Many people who really get into butterfly farming and ramp it up to this scale are excellent botanists. They know tons about plants. So this, I, I seem to see this more and more when I'm looking for research about butterfly farms, is they're like people with master's degree in botany, or um, maybe they are PhDs in some sort of agriculture. So they have a real grounding for how to make plants work. I can't overemphasize the how important that is that you really have to be a good farmer or all your butterflies are going to die. So you really got to get your plants down first. Someone wanted to start a small butterfly farm or a business because I know that sometimes places like this wholesale their butterflies out to people that are interested in doing that. Mm -hmm. what, um, what advice would you give a new person? <laughs> Stay with the local butterflies to your area. And how do you actually get them? Do you order them from a wholesaler? Like yep, there's many all around the country. And how, What about advice as far as building a proper habitat for them? And, uh, you know, uh, because if someone's never done it before, where would they start? You have to know a lot about plants. Both our head curator and his assistant have degrees in plant biology and ecology. So you have to know a lot about plants. I gotcha. To maintain the different life cycles of the butterfly. Is there classes or something like that? Or like, where do you learn about this? Uh, most lepidopterists, that's butterfly and moth scientists, are self-taught. They often will do internships at other museums. But the English actually invented the idea of a butterfly house back in the 19th century in London. So if somebody starts off small, doing like a little greenhouse or a little butterfly farm, what are the sources of income they normally, who buys butterflies? Like I saw that they sell them to weddings, they sell right. them to parties or something. Like, right. what would you do? Can you give me some advice on I that? don't think you could make any money doing that. <laughs> Sorry. So you really make money by It would having... be more of a hobby. I was, I was wondering how people start and if they can yeah. make money by selling or, uh, or having like a tent at a, an event or something. Yeah, people ever seen do that. Like that. Oh, yeah, yeah. It looks... Just the, the, we have four greenhouses to maintain the plants and to grow the caterpillars. So we have to heat four greenhouses as well as this museum. Where, can you actually get... Uh, it, they're not open to the public. Where you can see the, yeah. them growing? Yeah. But I can show you some baby caterpillars if you want. Sure. So the host plant is the plant that the butterflies lay their eggs on. And you can see the embryo developing in each egg. And then once it's hatched, it becomes opaque. And these are baby blue morpho caterpillars. And so we'll bring these to our greenhouse, to our breeding areas, and let the caterpillars grow. And then when they pupate, we'll pin their chrysalis up on our nursery wall. So these are the eggs, the, the green mm -hmm. shells, and they're out of their eggs now. And they're, mm -hmm. they're, when do they actually start eating the leaves? Pretty soon. That's why there's a couple leaves in here. You can see the munch marks. How long does it take for them to come to... Oh, it varies by species, but a number of weeks. Thank you, Alicia. Welcome. 
Also, having a butterfly-themed gift shop is a great way to make a profit. One of the most profitable things they sell are actual butterflies. They sell larvae, and you can bring the butterfly home, teach a kid about its life cycle, or if you're just like me, you'd buy it just because it's cool. And there's a little monarch there, and he'll become a beautiful butterfly. Besides always having monarchs on hand, they do use other species as well as they come into season. Another source of income is the butterfly themed restaurant they run. Butterflies are worked into every aspect of the business here. Where else can you find butterfly shaped Rice Krispie treats and cookies? The interesting thing about this is there's really not many books or courses. It's very specialized. Like when I trying to do more research on this topic, I can only find a few. Obviously, if you're just starting, you don't really have any idea how hard this is and what you're getting into. I would suggest, honestly, just buying like a kid's book in a kid's kit and seeing if you can raise a butterfly from start to finish and have them go through a couple different life cycles on small scale before you go sink a bunch of money into it. I'll link a book in Amazon that um, I know about. And again, don't be offended, it's like a kid's book, but it's very good at explaining the monarch butterfly's life cycle. Again, monarchs are kind of like the superstars, you gotta get good at them first, and then you can add all the exotic butterflies. For the rest of the video, I'm gonna talk a lot less about business and show you what else Magic Wings has to offer. Hidden in the conservatory are lots of other animals. Since this place has been around for a while, they've expanded their ecosystem. There was a beautiful koi pond and there were some small birds in cages but a lot of them were out just flying around and free to do what they want. I really like these guys. I think they're partridges, I'm not sure. So if you know what they are, tell me in the comment section. There were also lots of reptiles and even some of them that you could touch under supervision. Like these people were touching this big guy here. The butterflies, of course, are the real stars of this show, but there sure are uh, lots of other animals. But before we move on to them, check out this butterfly. Can you see him? He looks like a leaf. He's just sitting there all hidden, but that's a butterfly. Ooh, look at this guy, blue and orange, West End, baby. Aww. And purple. What do you think happened to this He's guy? old. He's banged into things. Really? Mm-hmm. Wow. But they can usually still fly, even with damaged wings. Have you noticed how they have all these tricks on their camouflage? So that's this one has spots on the outside of its wings. Yeah. So the yeah. spots make it look like it's their head. So if a predator comes, I'll show you. So if a predator comes, they'll nip, they'll nip the little spot uh -huh. thinking it's the head right. of the animal but to they get still their have meal, enough room to but they fly. can get away. So they can withstand some damage to their wings. This one's a little too far gone. He's a candidate for our assisted living facility. <laughs> and our head curator can graft on new wings on a young butterfly. There's no wow. vascular reconstruction surgery. It's just a structural. We have to match uh -huh. up the wing type. Wow. And I think this butterfly might be too old, not a good That's candidate. Amazing. Our interview got interrupted because there was a butterfly stuck in a water dish, which she rescued and put back out. I guess this happens multiple times a day. Buddy, good eyes. Here, come on. Let's get you on some food. Oh, that was smart. Oh, sweetie pie. That's it. Guy. He's 15 and he likes to high five with his back foot. High five. Yeah. Ooh, let's do an Irish jig put, on your hand. Your <laughs> high five. Oh, yeah. Smile, pretty. Who's our good boy? Before we went into the conservatory, we actually started our tour in a terrarium room that had all kinds of bugs and reptiles. So if you have some kids that are into that, they'd probably love coming here. Check out some of these. Of course, when the butterflies eventually die, they keep them and put them on display. 
And of course I went right to the Madagascar hissing cockroaches. Which I think they are the biggest roach on the planet. I think they're also very stinky. One of my favorite insects as a kid were the leaf and stick insects. And here you can find them. There's one right there. They're really long. They do a great job of looking like a dead stick. Let's see if you can see the others in here. This jungle nymph I've never seen before, but I tried to find him. He was really kind of tough to see in there, but look how big he is look, compared to my finger. That is one giant bug. Of course, there's some teasers of some butterflies before you enter the main area. You can get a good view of them feeding here in these cool sponges. This prickly devil is also really neat. Seems like all the big insects are from New Guinea. But look at him chomping that. He is crushing that plant with his little mandibles. Well, his gigantic mandibles, I should say. I love anything in nature that's metallic. I really don't understand how that happens. So these beetles were pretty cool. They look fake because they're so shiny. Also love the giant beetles. This guy, the Hercules beetle, he's a rhinoceros beetle. Check out how big he is. He's pretty cool. The giant flower beetles are also really beautiful. I love that metallic color. So neat. And of course, everybody loves dart frogs. They're some of my favorite. I mean, who doesn't love all these beautiful colors? Pretty sure you're not supposed to lick them, or you're supposed to, one or the other. These geckos should probably be asked to wear underwear in public, but still, look how they grab the things. I love looking at geckos' feet on glass. It's pretty neat. We left the terrarium area and went outside to the outdoor area. But before we went, I grabbed this list to show, hey, if you want butterflies in your yard, this is some helpful hints. So you can pause this video and read along. And I'd like to also show you what to grow to attract them. There's about four different bushes that are real successful if you live up in the New Hampshire area. We went out to the outdoor gardens and we got to kind of see a little more behind the scenes. There's at least four different greenhouses out here where the public's not allowed in. So I hope if the owners are watching this, they'll invite me back for a behind the scenes tour. There's also lots of wild butterflies in the outdoor garden. Here they're enjoying some tropical milkweed and butterfly bushes, which are really easy to grow and bring in all kinds of butterflies. As you take a tour out to the yard, you'll see different kinds of plants everywhere that butterflies like. But it reminds me that the cheapest way to get started is sometimes to build a little area outside. That way you don't have to spend a bunch of money at a greenhouse. Just do it for the summer months and be done with it and start up again six months later. When I read more about it online, a lot of people started out just by getting good at growing the flowers that butterflies like. So you might want to practice a season or two of trying to get everything to bloom on schedule and correctly without getting dead. Many people on a budget start with just a small butterfly enclosement like this one. It's just basically a screened porch where you put their favorite plants in and you raise them from there then you just start over next year. You can also put the caterpillars in bags right on the trees so it keeps them safe from predators. So even if you aren't gonna start your own butterfly company, if you have a chance to visit something like this, you gotta go. It is just one of the most unbelievable experiences I ever had. I'd love to hear your thoughts on butterfly farming. Please leave any comments below. Especially if you have any experience with butterfly farming, I'd love to hear from you. Don't forget, if you haven't subscribed yet, please subscribe to my channel. Also, give this a thumbs up, a like, a share, or if you have something to add, remember to comment below. Thanks. Also, don't forget to stop by terranlupo.com. I have up videos that you can't see anywhere else. Currently, I have one on carnivorous plants 
and also how to make your own mead. All you have to do is go over and sign up at terranlupo.com and all that's free.